the master metalist, Dunninger. Good evening, everyone. I think I can be a thrilling thought reader if my audience will give me some thrilling thoughts to work out. Someone in the audience tonight is concentrating his or her mind upon a name and a number. I receive the initials H.M.K., Corporal H.M.K. Where does that come from, please? That thought is coming from a lady in the center of the studio who is seated about 35 rows down the auditorium. The young man at the mic travels up the steps to get to the lady. Madam, is that your thought? Yes, sir. Uh, have we ever met before? Never. Uh, those are the initials that you were thinking about. Yes, sir. The full name as I mentally receive it is Henry M. Krauss, spelled K-R-A-U-S. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Is this number you have in mind the corporal's number? Yes. Remember, please, that I cannot give you any locations. That is a war secret military secret, and please do not concentrate upon anything that might possibly lend itself toward aiding our enemies in any fashion. But I will give you the number, which of course is known only to you. The number as I mentally receive it is one, two, oh, three, nine, eight, one, and six. Is that correct? Co correct. I thank you. <laughs> Wait a minute, Dunninger. Even if you can go on like this all night, I can't stand it. Stand what, Glenn? Well, I can't stand to see one of the loveliest ladies in show business sit here without being introduced. Ladies and gentlemen, here's a famed singing star who opens at the cotillion room of the Hotel Pierre next week. A beauty contest winner, if I ever saw one, Jane Pickens. And while I have my oar in, I'm going to pull as fast as I can. Right next to Jane Pickens is certainly no beauty contest winner, but he has been a winner for over 30 years with one of the most beloved of all cartoon strips. Ladies and gentlemen, the creator of Maggie and Jigs, the author of Bringing Up Father, who was chosen last week by the Laugh Makers of America as principal Laugh Maker of 1944, George McManus. Glenn. Uh, don't rush me, Dunninger. Our third judge is a Scotch as Heather and has come all the way from Wheeling, West Virginia, expenses paid by his sponsor, to get that $10,000 Dunninger offers to anyone who can prove he uses any accomplices or confederates who could possibly assist him in his thought readings. Here's radio's own star of the musical Steelmakers, Wheeling Steel's old-timer, Mr. John Winchcolt. Uh, do you like uh, radio, old-timer? Do I like radio? Look, my bro laddie, where else can you find $10,000 grabbing you by the hand and saying, take me home? Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> do you refer by any chance to the $10,000 offer of a renowned member of the clan, Dunninger? <laughs> None other, laddie. <laughs> Say, Dunninger, I'm your pal, and I'm warning you, when a Scotchman sets his eye on that much money, look out, brother. <laughs> well, I hope there'll be no hard feelings, old-timer if I keep my hand and my 10000 in my pocket. And now watch me closely. The $10,000 sweepstake is on. Someone in the audience is concentrating his or her mind upon a name, the simple and good old name of Mary, M-A-R-Y, associated with a number, the number which I mentally receive is 924. Where does that come from, please? Mary, 924, about the 25th row on the left side of the studio. Is that your thought, Mary? Yes, it is. Are we never met before, is that correct? No. Would Mary be your mother's name? No. It isn't your mother's name. Is it some friend's name, or whose name is it, please? My sister. Your sister's name. Is it true that you are concentrating upon her present address? Yes. The 924, uh, therefore, is part of that address, is that correct? Yes. Does she res reside at 18th Avenue? Yes. I thank you very much. Some lady or gentleman in the audience is concentrating his or her mind upon a sentence or a quotation which he or she has made in their notebook before coming to the studio tonight. Is there anyone who has made this notation at home in their notebook? The words, ask and ye shall receive. Whose thought is that, please? Ask and ye shall receive. There to the left side of the auditorium, about the 
20th row, young lady, second seat from the left. Is that your thought, young lady? Yes. Have we ever met before? No. Is it true that you made this notation your own notebook? Yes. Are you also thinking of a name and saying what name am I thinking about? And does that name begin with the letter B? That's right. Would that be Blossom? Yes. It is Blossom. Thank you very much. Blossom. <laughs> Who among you is thinking of the initials W J? Z, or not Z, C. W-J-C. Where does that come from, please? That is on the right side of the auditorium, about the 35th or 36th row. Uh, of a gentleman's thought, two have raised their hands to those initials. Uh, the one person that's concentrating their mind upon this thought is thinking of the Junto, J-U-N-T-O, or Joto. Jun that's right. Is that yours, sir? That's mine. Uh, what type of name is that, may I ask? That's a member of a club. A member of a club. Or a that, name of a club, rather. A name of a club. Is that located in, in uh, Pennsylvania? No. Are you thinking of McKee's Port, perchance? That's right. Is that not in Pennsylvania? That's right. Oh, it in is Pennsylvania. Right. Sir? It's in Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania. That is your fault. But is there someone near you that is thinking of a name beginning with letter B? I get Burton. B U R. T-O-N. Where does that come from, please? Right. The lady that's on the right. other side right of the aisle. Is that your thought, young lady? Yes, that's right. Did you ask your question by making a notation in your own notebook? That's right. Perfect. I, I like it very much when you write your questions in notebooks. That eliminates the old-fashioned idea of the possibility of employing sleight of hand in doing this type of work. Remember, I make no supernatural claims. At the same time, the matters of accomplishing results is not quite as simple as all that. At the same time, I receive an impression of someone thinking of May 15th and a B. Where does that come from, please? The lady in the second row, right here. No, the second row. Second row, right here. May 15th and a B. Is that your thought, young lady? Would you kindly identify it over the microphone? Yes, it is. That is 100% accurate? Yes. I thank you. Someone near you or at the opposite side of you is thinking of 99N. Where does that come from, please? 99N. That is the lady about the 20th row, I should say, the right side of the auditorium. Is that your thought, young lady? Yes, it is. Uh, we never met before? No, we haven't. Are you thinking of uh, a name beginning with a B? I get B-E-R-N-I-E -E or some such name? That's correct. That is correct. I am obliged to you. Hazelhurst. Who is thinking of that, please? Hazelhurst. That is the lady about the 12th row. Is that your thought, young lady? Yes, it is. You have a number of, your, of thoughts in your mind, haven't you? What are they? What are they? Well, I couldn't possibly give you all of them. <laughs> but are you thinking of a word, a word that looks like uh, introduction or something like that? No. No, that doesn't come from you. Is there anyone near you that is thinking of the word moving? M-O-V-I-N-G. And a B-H. As a lady in the center of the auditorium, about the 40th row. Is that your thought, young lady? That's right. Did you make that notation in your own notebook? Yes, I did. You have. Perfect. Uh, moving. I don't get the significance. Uh, has that anything to do with the number you have in mind? No. Well, aren't you also thinking of B-H-888? Yes, I am. What type of number is that, please? It's a license plate number. Oh, your license plate number. What is that Mel that you are thinking about, M-E-L? My fiancé. Oh, that is his name? That's right. Well, are you saying to me mentally that he is traveling? No, that was another thought. That is another thought. <laughs> well, that's probably someone else that's traveling. I don't know. But are you thinking of the word amazing? Yes, in relation to you. Oh, thanks. That's... <laughs> uh, would that be 095 as well in your mind? That's right. You thought of that subconsciously. You didn't choose to send it across to me, but I received it. Isn't that so? <laughs> yes, it is. Thank you very much. Uh, there is someone here that's asking me something about a horse. The fourth race in Jamaica. Whose thought is that, please? That is yours, madam. On the left side of the auditorium... Madam, that's I've right. heard that, yeah, that kind, right. worn tale that the horses carry tails, but they never speak to me. But believe me, I can't even read their thoughts. They never think for me. <laughs> I've tried it very often. It can't be done. You see, I'm only a, a thought reader. I'm not a fortune teller. I, I cannot read a horse's mind.
Who among you was thinking of Paris, France, and the name of a structure there? In Paris, France. Where does it come from, please? That is the lady about the fifth row. Is that your thought, madam? Yes. yes. Did you ask me to give you the one point in all of Paris that you were concentrating upon? That's right. In other words, the words that you've written upon your question were, what is the place in Paris that I am thinking about? Yes. That is correct. Yes. The answer is known only to you. That's right. And has not been placed upon paper. Is that the Eiffel Tower? That's right. The Eiffel Tower is correct. Thank you. <laughs> the initials, the initials, RJP. Where does that come from, please? RJP. That is yours? That's right. Uh, we never met before, madam? No. Uh, that name, would that be a, a relative of yours? Yes. Son's name? No. No. Uh, I get Richard very clearly That's from right. your thoughts. Is that right? That's right. Would that be Richard J. Potter? That's right. Are you asking me to tell you where Richard J. Potter is at this time? That's right. Do you know where he is? I do. Because if you don't know, I can tell you. You appreciate that. I'm no fortune teller. I'm not a psychic. I can only... Call the thoughts that you were thinking about. He is in Texas. That's right. He is in Dallas, Texas. Right. Thank you very much. <laughs> How can I stop my husband snoring at night? <laughs> Raise your hand, madam. I don't know. I, I don't know what to suggest unless... Well, there's one way out. Why don't you get him a night job and put him to sleep in the daytime? That is... Well, Mr. McManus, how's Dunninger doing? He's doing as well as corned beef does with cabbage. What <laughs> more can I say? <laughs> well, you couldn't say any more, sir, but don't mention corned beef and cabbage again or Dunninger will go out and get a platter and leave us flat. Miss Pickens, what do you say? Well, so far, all I can say is I'm just flabbergasted. <laughs> That's fine, thank you. A word with you, Dunninger. Yeah, remember what I said, Dunninger. Look out, pal. Well, <laughs> this bony lassie and I want you to do a favor for us, Dunninger. Here it comes. Hold everything, Glenn. Okay, old timer, what's up? Well, I came up from Wheeling with a suitcase and checked in at the station to save a hotel bill. <laughs> And uh, if you can tell me what station, the number of my check, and what's in my bag, Jane Pickens will give you and me a real treat. All right. She'll sing for us. Well, and if I can't? <laughs> then you'll sing. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> well, that would be very disastrous. I've, I, I've simply got to read your thoughts, old-timer, and there's nothing I'd rather do than to hear Jane Pickens sing. Well, would you mind, old-timer, answering one or two questions before I begin? Am I accurate in stating that at this time you are the only man in all the world who knows the exact and complete contents of your bag? That's right, Dunninger. You have relayed, or rather, passed the number of the check on to Miss Pickens, but that is all. She's the only one that knows. Besides have you tell. made any written notation about the contents of your bag? Uh-uh, never. Have I requested you to write it? No. You haven't written it. It only appears in your mind. That's all. And you pledge your word of honor to this audience that I've asked you absolutely not a single question relative to the contents of that bag. That's correct, folks. That is upon your word. Upon my word. I do this only to disprove the theory of the necessity of writing information. It has been stated that I cannot read a thought unless a notation has been made. You have been... You will pledge the word of honor, the man whose honesty we cannot possibly contradict, to the absolute truth that in doing this reading, I have requested no written notations of any order at any time. That is important. And remember that I am reading an impression known only to one man. You, sir, have checked your bag, if I get it accurately, mentally, at exactly 11 minutes to 12. Before noon, the Grand Central Station at a station post of the lower level. Is that correct? <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> the bag contains... Think hard, please, of its contents. The bag contains uh, what seems to be a horseshoe. 
<laughs> Did you bring a silver golly. horseshoe with you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, a horseshoe. A silver horseshoe. <laughs> See if I can work this thing out accurately now. No, no, it isn't silver. And not a silver? No, it's made out of wheeling steel. Oh. <laughs> well, all right. I, I, I give myself an average of 10% of failure, sir. Made uh, of steel. Did you likewise have in your bag a uh, package of cigarettes, Chesterfield, is that correct? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Striped pajamas. <laughs> Striped pajamas. <laughs> Have you a toothbrush right. and a photograph, a picture I of yourself been. and another person? Correct. Concentrate your mind upon the name of the person in the picture. Would that be L Lewis or you're pronouncing it? I get Louise or Lewis. It's not accurate. May, M-A-E. Would that be Nolte? Lois May Nolte, believe it or not. I thank you, sir, very much. Just another few moments, uh, Mr. Old Timer. I want to give you the number of that check. Would that be seven five one seven three? None other. I thank you. What do you say, Miss Pickens? Well, since Dunninger told the truth, it looks as though I'd better say the consequences. Grand. <laughs> A little late arriving in my lonely world over here. For you have left me, and where is our April of old? You have left me, and winter continues cool. As if to say spring will be a little late to start, a little late reviving that music it made in my heart. Yes, time heals all things. So I mustn't cling to this fear. It's only that spring will be a little late. Miss Pickens. Now get out your pencil and paper as Dunninger prepares for projection time. Inspired by the presence of Jiggs and Maggie's creator, George McManus, Dunninger has chosen five well known comic strips. His projection will be one of the following Flash Gordon, <coughs> Dick Tracy, Blondie, Terry and the Pirates, The Lone Ranger. Now don't play favorites. Make your mind positive blank. When I say concentrate, write down the first impression that you receive. Here again are the titles. Flash Gordon, Dick Tracy, Blondie, Terry and the Pirates, The Lone Ranger. All right, let's try. Ready? Begin. Concentrate. Well, now for tonight's Brain Buster. The maddest thing Dunninger has ever attempted. But being Dunninger, he's an experimenter. George McManus will leave the studio with a blackboard. And while he's alone outside, he'll draw a cartoon character in action. Meanwhile, Dunninger, inside the studio, in front of the audience, will try to duplicate George McManus's drawing on another blackboard. Incidentally, Dunninger can hardly draw a straight line. Says who, Glenn? <laughs> 
Did you say walk the straight line or draw? Dunninger, I said draw, and I meant that. Oh, Glenn, Glenn. I I can do a little better than that. (laughs) All right, Uh, Mr. McManus, our experiment now is a rather difficult one. I'm relying entirely upon your cooperation. You recognize the fact, of course, that you have complete liberty of selecting any picture of any character, any comic strip, or anyone else, or anyone other that you choose to select. You understand that, of course, do you not, sir? I do. I haven't asked you a single question, nor have I prompted you in any way as to reference or with reference to the diagram which you have now been requested to so kindly draw. Is that correct? That's correct. Would you now be good enough to walk to any part of the building, escorted by one of the ushers, be sure that the usher does not see what you draw, and would you kindly, as rapidly as you can, since we're on the air and time is very valuable, draw whatever impression you have mentally chosen? Would you kindly do that, sir? I will. I'm going to come back to us just as rapidly as you can. Mr. McManus is now being led out of the auditorium. No, he's not being led. He manages to get there all, all right upon his own. Gentlemen, you can draw a single line. And complimenting myself all along, Glenn, upon my tremendous ability as an amateur craftsman. Well, I'm just joking, of course, but I'm going to try and get the impression of the diagram where Mr. McManus is now about to sketch at an approximate distance of 200 feet. He has left the auditorium or the studio, as you choose to call it. He is now beginning to draw. He is now beginning to draw, because his picture would be far better than my own. I'm making my lines upon this slate as I go along. This is just a rough idea of, uh, of his diagram. Now, this is of particular interest. I hope that you can all see what I'm drawing. Watch this end particularly. This is important. Of course, Mr. Bigmanis, I hope, is making a better job of this than I am. Well, that's about as close as I can get to that. I hope it isn't very far from being accurate. Would you ask Mr. McManus, please, to come in? Remember, uh, he isn't quite through yet. He has placed the last line upon his diagram now. Uh, This is the line that he is drawing. I'll point it out to you as we go along. There it is. Would you please see if Mr. McManus is ready? And then if he is, bring him back into the studio, please. Don't tell me that I'm ahead of Mr. McManus. Of course, there is a difference in the diagrams, even if accurate, I assure you of that. But this is it, anyway. And the important thing, which my radio audience cannot see, is the thing I've pointed to. I'm now turning it away so that Mr. McManus cannot see what I have drawn. Remember, he stood at a distance of several hundred feet. He's been in back of a steel wall behind closed doors. He alone is the only one that knew what he has sketched. Would you please bring it to me so that I might... Compare notes, sir, with what you have drawn. Mr. McManus is still concealing the diagram from view. It isn't terrible if you made it, sir, I assure you. Well, here it is, anyway. How close are we? (laughs) Donninger, by golly, you did it. What's the good word, Mr. McManus? I think he's better than I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jane Pickens, what can you say to keep Dunninger from inflating his well-proportioned ego? Well, I could tell him to go out and win a beauty contest, but after tonight, I'm I'm afraid he'd find a way to do that, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, old-timer, I hate to say this, but you look something like a deflated bagpipe. Mm. Did you see bagpipe, Mr. Riggs? I, th- I did. Well, <laughs> I'm just wondering about the extra bag I brought with me. It's a money bag. Uh, oh, so, <laughs> so you really thought you were going to get my $10,000? Well, I guess this bag is going to remain deflated, too. <laughs> I'm afraid so, old-timer, if you're waiting for my ten grand. <laughs> well, Dunninger, even if I didn't win the money, I've had $10,000 worth of fun on this program tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, <laughs> Now here's Dunninger to say... I believe that my listening audience should know that I have duplicated the Magmanus drawing. Uh, He decided to select the famous character of Jiggs, front face, with the one eye closed, winking at his audience, the usual high hat, flower to the left side of his lapel, and a sort of uh, front face caricature somewhat different from his usual drawings. 
I succeeded in reproducing that picture word for word. Is that correct, sir? Correct. That is correct. Dunninger, the master mentalist, was rebroadcast for the American Armed Forces and their allies. And now, the storyteller. Listen as a tale unfolds. Here is tonight's story, The Case of the Canine Critic. The French painter Armand Villiers steps back from the picture to which he has just put the finishing touches. It is excellent. He has caught the grossness, the dominating quality of the society dowager who is the subject of the portrait. It is not pretty, but then neither is the sitter. However, Mrs. Lanfar has insisted that she be allowed to approve the portrait before she pays the artist one cent. And his forehead wrinkles anxiously as he hears her heavy steps upon the stair, accompanied by the barking of her spoiled poodle, Wowser. When Mrs. Lanfar enters, the artist welcomes her and leads her directly to the painting, displayed naturally under the most flattering light in the room. Then he stands back to wait. Mrs. Lanfar lifts Wowser in her arms and says, Voici, Wowser, what do you think of it? The dog yawns, squirms uneasily in his mistress's fat arms and looks about with a bored expression. The dowager turns on Villiers. I will not take it, she says flatly. Mon Dieu, not even my own precious pet recognizes me. It is no good. With that, she turns on her heel and waddles out of the studio. The Frenchman at first feels impelled to sue his patron, but upon reflection, he realizes he doesn't stand a chance to collect. No, he must use guile to sell his client the painting. He stands a while in thought before the portrait, and then his brow clears. He has it. He knows just the thing to do. The next day, he rings Mrs. Lanfar on the phone. He would like her opinion on them if she will trouble to return to his studio. When he wins her consent to appear, he rushes to the picture with a twinkle in his eyes. The next day, the dowager arrives with her obnoxious wowser. She inspects the painting critically and admits grudgingly... It seems to resemble me a little more. But there is only one way to find out. Here, Wowser. She scoops her poodle up in her arms once more expectantly. Again, Wowser evidences no interest. See, complains Mrs. Lanfar, she still does not recognize me. Desperate, the artist replies, oh, But, madame, dogs are notoriously nearsighted. All the pet a little nearer to the picture. Mrs. Lanfar holds Wowser closer to the portrait, and instantly a change comes over. He struggles in his mistress's arms, making frantic efforts to kiss the painted image of his mistress. Voila, says the Frenchman. He adores your likeness. The bargain is sealed. The satisfied dowager writes out a check for the full amount and sweeps out of the studio after exacting a promise that the picture will be delivered immediately. Only after he is sure that she and Wowser have gone out the front door does Armand Villiers pull out a fresh piece of fat bacon from the pocket of his smock and throw it away. The piece of bacon which he had smeared liberally over the oil painting that morning and which Wowser alone had detected. Mm -hmm. 